win or lose this race, we can help get the word out and create real momentum among the American public for major change, a restoration of the rule of law, a restoration of our core constitutional values, getting us away from being this warmongering, human rights denying nation that we've become, very sadly. And then also setting things right in terms of our economy where so many people are struggling. We have the greatest economic disparity in the United States since the 1920s on the eve of the Great Depression. And it's so unjust. Thank you very much for your generosity being sure. here in Los Angeles. And I know you're running as a presidency, uh, presidential nominee for 2012 in the United States. Um, a lot of people know you in the United States, but I think it would be very nice to have your background. You know, you've been a mayor of South Lake City. If you could elaborate on that, your background. Okay. Well, I grew up in Utah. I went to the University of Utah, did some graduate work, then ended up going to law school at George Washington University. I practiced law for 21 years. It was all in the area of civil litigation. I represented plaintiffs in antitrust cases, sued financial institutions, did civil rights work, uh, had a, a varied litigation practice. Then I ran for Congress in 1996, won a very hard fought primary race, but then lost uh, primarily because in 1996, I was advocating marriage equality. Uh, then I went back to my law practice and then ran for mayor of Salt Lake City. I won that race by 20% at the end of 1999. I was sworn in in the year 2000 and then served two terms. I was reelected in 2003. So during that time that I was mayor, uh, it, it was amazing what we were able to accomplish in Salt Lake City, and a lot of it had uh, real national and even international repercussions. After I left the mayor's office, and I did that voluntarily, I wasn't uh, defeated and I wasn't term limited, but I wanted to work in the area of human rights. I started High Road for Human Rights and uh, did that for about three and a half years. And the whole idea behind that was organizing people at the grassroots level so that we could push for our government to respond when there are major human rights abuses anywhere in the world. Then when I saw the state of this country and where things were headed, I really decided we could accomplish the same kinds of things that we were attempting to do with High Road for Human Rights, but probably with more impact by forming a new political party and then running as president. Because I think win or lose this race, we can help get the word out and create real momentum among the American public for major change, a restoration of the rule of law, a restoration of our core constitutional values, getting us away from being this warmongering, human rights denying nation that we've become, very sadly. And then also setting things right in terms of our economy where so many people are struggling. We have the greatest economic disparity in the United States since the 1920s on the eve of the Great Depression. And it's so unjust. That's why I love the name of the Justice Party. We're, it's all about economic justice, social justice, and environmental justice. And of course, the, the, the corrupting influence of money has kept our government from putting in place a decent health care system. It costs tens of thousands of lives every year. Uh, it causes over 700,000 bankruptcies every year. We're the only country in the industrialized world where that happens. And then most sadly for our earth and its inhabitants and those who come along in the future, because of the corrupting influence of money of the fossil fuel industry, we have failed dismally to provide the essential international leadership on climate change. So we in the anti-war movement, we know you as somebody who has stood to George Bush and told him that he's guilty and guilty of war criminal. Could you elaborate on that? 
Well, yeah, so I fought against the, our involvement in Iraq even before the invasion. Uh, I saw that our government was lying to us. The American people were just dutifully falling in line, I think because of the fear inspired by 9-11, the lies told by the Bush administration, the failure of the Bush administration to disclose the American people in Congress, the truth about the divisions in our intelligence community about what the president was telling us. All this nonsense about Saddam Hussein building up a nuclear capacity, the, re the intelligence agency within the State Department and the Department of Energy said, they put it in writing in a national intelligence estimate, that that is absolutely wrong. This notion that Saddam Hussein was trying to buy uranium from Niger, uh, the State Department's intelligence agency said it's highly dubious. So we knew that, that, that as a nation, our leaders, knew. I have a hard time calling them leaders because I think they're led mostly by the polls and what they think is going to be politically popular. But these folks knew that what they were telling the American people in Congress were lies. That's an impeachable offense. And they, they march our nation into a, an illegal war of aggression. Two secretaries general of the United Nations stated the obvious, and that is that this was a war of aggression completely at odds with international law. And then the human rights violations that accompanied this war of aggression. For the first time in our nation's history, as a matter of official policy, we're kidnapping, disappearing, and torturing people. And now the President of the United States signing into law a bill that, that, that purports to allow our government to point the finger at anybody, anywhere in the world, including U.S. citizens, national and say defense. that they can, as part of the National Defense Appropriations Act, providing that they can be rounded up, basically kidnapped, disappeared, held incommunicado, no legal assistance, no right of habeas corpus, no charges, and no trial. This is so subversive to everything that this country has stood for. And yet this president, has, has kept the Democratic Party from being an opposition party because now they're part of it. They're doing things that we never dreamt, even under the Bush administration, could be done by our federal government. So do you still hold the belief that George Bush, Cheney are guilty of war crimes and you, are you extending it to Obama? There's no question that George Bush and Dick Cheney are guilty of war crimes. They've essentially admitted it. Torture is a war crime both under the Geneva Conventions, the Convention Against Torture, the, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Those are our international obligations that, that committed us unequivocally, without exception, never to be involved in torture. But even under our own domestic laws passed by Congress, the War Crimes Act of 1996, the Federal Anti-Torture Statute, they all make it illegal. So what happened? President Obama comes into power and, and says, as, as a tyrant, <laughs> that we're not going to apply these laws to these people who were previously so powerful. Now, what kind of a nation is that? What kind of a government is it where one person determines what laws are going to be applied and as to whom? That's not equal justice under the law. That's a two-tiered system of criminal justice that's unknown to this country under our Constitution. That's the, that's the kind of government that Dick Nixon, Richard Nixon talked about when after he was run out of office and he was interviewed. And he said, well, if the president does it, that means it's not illegal. That is tyranny. It's the very definition of dictatorship. So you stepping into places uh, a place where W.D. Du Bois ran for presidency of the United States. Ralph Nader has run for presidency of the United States. What do you see yourself in the history of the United States at this moment? I'm running for president, and I helped co-found the Justice Party because we need people across the political spectrum, not just a sliver on the left, like we heard from at these, during these debates today. But we need people across 
the political spectrum to come together and say, we're not going to stand for our government to be for sale anymore. We're going to get the corrupting influence of money out of our government, out of our electoral system. We're going to stand up for the rule of law, for due process. We're going to stand up for the war power clause, not allow one person, the president, to send our nation to war again. And there are the, these common values that we all share. It, it doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green, Socialist, Justice Party, it doesn't matter. We all have so much in common that's really at stake as we see our republic transforming into something unknown during the entire course of our nation's so, history. So is the moment that's calling you to a step forward? This, what's happening right now is why I stepped forward and said I will run for president. And, and it doesn't mean that we have to win to make a difference. It's creating the momentum, creating a people's movement, and bringing people together across the political spectrum to really make a difference. Could you talk about your unifying points? What, you say you want to bring everybody together, the socialists, the uh, social democrats, the progressive democrats. You want to bring them together. Can you talk about your unifying points? Yes, I think the unifying points in this country, and, and we can bring people of all parties, Republicans, Libertarians, Democrats, Socialists, Green Party, Justice Party, we can bring everybody together on these points. We all agree, I think, that corrupting money should not control what our government does. I think we can all agree that the rule of law needs to be applied regardless of one's wealth, regardless of one's position of power. That that's what this, this country is all about. We fought wars. We've had so many people give, make the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms, and they're being destroyed. Our Constitution is being eviscerated, and it's because of the Republicans and the Democrats coming together and giving such short shrift to the public interest as they're trying to keep their control. And they're, they're doing the same thing with Wall Street still putting our nation at risk. They still haven't broken up the banks that are considered too big to fail. Every single day that that doesn't happen, our economy is at risk. The world economy is at risk. You, you mentioned that you have a, and I'll put it in my terms, it's an enemy for you, which is money. Super PACs, uh, the um, United Citizens uh, court case that was passed. Uh, how are you going to do this? I mean. I'm pretty sure you're a very smart person, you're running for the presidency, but you have this uh, a large body that's blocking you. And they're saying that it's the money that buys the votes. If you ask the people in this country, two thirds of them at least, will say that they want to see the Citizens United case reversed. And how do you do it? Not with the Supreme Court apparently, although that is a possibility. When, well, when this new case comes before them. But there are two things you can do. Amend the Constitution. And if, if there were ever cause to amend the Constitution, this certainly is easy. it. It's not an easy thing to do, but I think it would be much easier under these circumstances because the people in this country have had it with the corrupting influence of money. But there's a second measure that could be undertaken, and that is Congress could deprive the United States Supreme Court, and all federal courts actually, if they chose to do that, deprive them of jurisdiction to consider cases involving our electoral system. If Congress wanted to pass campaign finance reform, they could do it, and at the same time, they could deprive the federal courts of jurisdiction to consider challenges to those laws. But you're asking them to bite a hand that's feeding them right now. Well, it, it, that's the point, though, that if we create a people's movement, if, if people feel strongly enough about this and those in Congress know that their political future is on the line, we can make this happen. This is still a country where people can organize, they can utilize the democratized means of social media and bring about these changes, but only if we will. Only if we will get out of our chairs, turn off the TV, 
watch a few less basketball games and get active in our political system, come together and let it be known by our elected officials that the next time around they will be defeated unless they do what we tell them to do and that is get the corrupting influence of money out of our political system. So you know that uh, to my understanding, and you can correct me please, uh, I believe there is a, a right-wing populism that's been really perking up ever since Obama won the office with the uh, teabagger party and all that. Yeah. And it's very dominating. How do you challenge that? Well, I, I think in large part we can come together with a lot of those people because they're sick and tired of abusive government. They're sick and tired of our government being bought and paid for. Uh, you know, we may argue over issues like health care. I mean, these people that think that it's socialism somehow. I mean, of course, that's absurd. But I think most people are getting really tired of these for-profit insurance companies raping and pillaging the American people. We're the only nation in the industrialized world that depends upon a for-profit insurance system for the provision of essential health care. We're better people than that. The vast majority of people in this country want to see a single-payer Medicare for all system. So, Two more questions, uh, and, okay. hope, and thanks for your patience. I know you had a long day, and most probably you're traveling back home. Um, can you talk about your domestic policies and your foreign policies if you become the president? That's a pretty broad question. We could be here all <laughs> afternoon on that. But in terms of domestic policy, well, well, like the, 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 the biggest thing, we, the most important thing we need to do yes. is clean up our government. Because if you, don't, if you don't get the corrupting influence of money out of the way, then we're not going to see these other reforms. We need to provide jobs for the American people. We shouldn't be in a recession right now. We need to return those jobs that have been outsourced to other nations. And again, this is the Democrats and the Republicans responsible for this. We need to set up a program like the WPA project and, and provide millions of jobs and at the same time, repair our deteriorating infrastructure. Our infrastructure problems are something that we can't just keep putting off and handing off to the next generation. We've got to face up to what's happening to our roads, our bridges, our schools. And in terms of our economy, we, we have to break up the banks that are too large to fell. Uh, we've got to deal with the student loan crisis. I mean, we have student loans that now have exceeded the, the amount of credit card debt. And credit card debt, by the way, is dischargeable in bankruptcy, and student loans are not. And then, of course, the mortgage crisis. How would you do that? I mean, do, are we going to bring uh, Glass-Steagall uh, Act? Uh, Glass-Steagall Act should be yes. restored, absolutely. You shouldn't have commercial banks using your money and my money to go out and invest in these risky investments, combining investment banks with commercial banks and with insurance companies. But this is what Alan Greenspan got started. And Glass-Steagall was repealed under the Clinton administration. Once again, it's the Democrats and the Republicans. It's been disastrous in the deregulation of financial institutions, getting rid of reserve requirements. It's insane. What did we expect would happen? And especially if banks are considered too big to fail. And if people don't understand that, they need to know that what that means is, regardless of how much these folks lose in their risky investments as they're trying to make more and more money, if they fail to do that, the government has to bail them out unless we're gonna face a major depression. So people that, that complain about the bank bailouts the real problem was that we had deregulation and the massive fraud on Wall Street with our government turning a blind eye, saying, you know, all that's really okay. There's not going to be any accountability. We basically set it up. Our representatives, our regulators, our presidents basically set up the situation that then did require the bank bailouts. So they guarantee to get their money back no matter who fails. The government would bail them out. Yeah. Anyway, so that's what they and then they're bailed out and then they stick their pockets full of more and more millions of dollars. I mean, it's just amazing how these people have profited from their own failures. 
but it wasn't their failure financially because we end up bailing them out. It's, it, it's an obscene, perverse system where we all get shafted and the people who created the situation keep getting rewarded. So excuse me for asking you this last question this way. So this is an empire, right? And, and you're trying to become a president of an empire that has wars, has two wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan, spends tons of millions and millions of dollars over there. It runs on military industrial complex, which is 40 to 50% of the budget. Aren't you afraid you might get assassinated the second day you become the president? Well, it, it, it is an empire. We need to end the empire. There are a lot of people with huge vested interests. I mean, just like with the, the fossil fuel industry. I'd like to put an end to it. I'd, I'd like to see an end to the use of coal. I'd like to see an investment in clean, renewable sources. And uh, I, I don't know if you know the story about diesel, who created the diesel engine. He ended up floating in the ocean. They found his body three days later because he was going to use peanut oil and, and coal gas or powdered coal uh, to fuel the diesel engine. And Standard Oil and Rockefeller, they were, they were a pretty ruthless bunch. Uh, there yeah, still aren't answers well. about what happened to him. So, you know, if you're going to let these fears, it's like letting the fear of the, the lesser of two evils, in my view, the more effective of two evils, lose to the greater of two evils. If you're going to let that stop you from moving toward change in this country, then we're just all reconfirming the status quo and it's going to continue to get worse. Uh, to me, the meaning of life is found in seeing things that are wrong and stepping forward and doing what you can to change them. And you don't let fear stop you. So thank you very much. So anything you would like to add and floor is yours. Just no, any I, message you want to give to people out there. Just that this is for all of us. This is an obligation we have as citizens, as moral actors, and it's also a great opportunity. And anybody that sees that these things are going wrong, we need all of us to provide leadership in, our, in the workplace, in our schools, in our churches, in our families, our neighborhoods. We all need to step forward, not be bystanders any longer. I mean, you may not be one of the wrongdoers, you may not be one of the perpetrators, but if you're going to stand by and just allow it to happen, then you are as culpable. You're accommodating it. Be an upstander. Stand up against it. Do everything you can. Join together. Organize. Rise up against this. Be a great citizen and be a true moral actor. We are busy bees around here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Our days are pretty booked up, you know. Take kids to school, you know, watch TV and, you know. Everybody, find, everybody can find excuses. The real heroes are people in everyday life who are willing to stand up against wrongdoing. And that is the clarion call right now for all of us regardless of any disagreements on particular issues, all of us to take on the wrongdoing, stand up for our nation, stand up for the future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.